Hello, everybody. Um, I want to thank the organizers and the governor for the invitation. And today I'm going to talk to you about um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and deep learning, which we've heard a little bit about, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. And my job here is to try to show you some of the capabilities of these technologies and also help you start thinking about your AI research plan. So uh, a brief introduction about me. Uh, I'm a professor at the University of Wyoming in computer science and artificial intelligence. And I direct the Evolving Artificial Intelligence Lab, which the governor was kind enough to visit last year. I also recently had a startup that was acquired by Uber. And so Uber has asked us to come over to San Francisco and help create Uber's artificial intelligence laboratories. So I'm on leave from the university while I'm doing that. And obviously at Uber, as you've heard a little bit yesterday, we have a ton of artificial intelligence challenges, such as driverless cars and you know, logistics of moving people and atoms through the entire world. So it's a tremendously exciting opportunity. So what is artificial intelligence? We've heard a little bit about it. But in short, it's trying to make smart software. So anything that makes software smarter is a form of AI. But ultimately, the goal of artificial intelligence is to create software that's smarter than human beings in every facet that human beings are intelligent, which is a tremendous and fun challenge to work on. So here are some examples that you've probably seen before of artificial intelligence, from chess playing robots to driverless cars, autopilot and planes, and Siri. Uh, it's becoming ubiquitous in the world, but we're just getting started. So I think one thing that helps you as the leaders in the world, politicians and business people, to try to navigate where is AI going to make an impact is to understand where does AI hold a competitive advantage versus humans currently, and where are humans tend to be better than AI, at least at present. And my general rule of thumb that I'd like to share with you is that whatever computers find really uh, hard, we find easy, and vice versa. So computers are great at multiplying very large numbers and dealing with large strings of symbols. They can do the exact same thing over and over and over again, uh, as you see here. And they can deal with games where the rules are precisely defined. But everything that we find effectively trivial, we don't even think about, computers find extremely difficult. So looking at an image and saying there's a dog or a bicycle in it, manipulating variously sized objects, walking through a field in Wyoming, or listening to the sounds that I'm making and knowing what words that I'm speaking, these are things that it's almost impossible to write a program to do, and therefore computers have historically struggled with them. However, just within the last few years, we have seen an absolute sea change in this area of computing. So lately, there's been one technology that has come out that has made computers much, much better at doing those sorts of tasks, and that is deep learning. So just to situate you and provide some context, deep learning is a form of machine learning, which is in turn a form of artificial intelligence. So if you hear about deep learning, it is also ML and it is also AI. So what is deep learning? The simplest way to think about it is that it is a computational brain that takes some sort of an input and then does some intelligent processing and produces an output. So you hand it a picture, and it says lion. Or you, if you want it to translate, you give it some Latin, and it will give you the corresponding English. So the, what I want to impress upon you is this is an insanely hard task. To a computer, a picture is a million numbers. That's it. So imagine writing a program where I give you a million numbers, and you write some code that looks at those numbers and says, aha, a scuba diver. And not only are you supposed to do that for that picture, you're supposed to have that program do it for all of these different pictures and generalize to new scuba divers it's never seen before. And it sounds impossible, and for decades it was impossible. And in about 2012, this started to work, and it started to work extremely well. So welcome to the era of deep learning. Nowadays, deep neural networks are better than humans at seeing and understanding pictures in some limited domains, and we're just getting started. So here, our picture is given to a deep neural network, and it says police van for this picture, and minivan is its second guess. Here, it actually gets it wrong, and it says uh, those are sunflowers, but its second guess is pumpkins. And you can kind of see why it looks like a field of sunflowers. And as I said, nowadays, these are results from 2012. The networks are much better now and are better than humans. So how does this technology work? You've probably heard about it, but you probably have no idea what is going on inside of these deep neural networks. Well, I'm going to show you that today. So in your brain are a bunch of cells called neurons. And one neuron can fire. And if it does, the neurons it's connected to, you may or may not fire, depending on what neurons it's connected to and how those are wired up. 
And which of those neurons are wired to which and how strongly produces an electrical storm that determines who you fall in love with, whether you like Shakespeare, and whether or not you prefer chocolate or vanilla. So computer scientists have abstracted this concept into a deep neural network, which is just a collection of nodes that are wired to other nodes in a network. And one neuron can cause other neurons to fire, and it's up to the deep learning algorithms to figure out which should be connected and in which way, what ways, and that will help me process a lion into the, the word, of this picture into the word lion. So this here is a deep neural network that has, or sorry, is a neural network that has about three layers in the middle. If we add more layers in the middle, somewhere between 6 and 150 and up to about a million neurons and 100 million connections, then we have ourselves what's called a deep neural network. And that's where the word deep comes, because we've added a lot of depth and layers to the network. So how do we train this huge tangle of connections to tell us lion when we give it this million, uh, million numbers? Well, it turns out that this is another depiction of the network. These are layers. I'll put in these pixels up here, run it through all of these layers, and out come the probability that the network thinks this is a lion or a dog or a bagel. And if the current network is wrong, for example, here it thought it was more likely to be a dog than a lion, then I will just change all of the weights in the network a little bit to make it more likely to say lion next time. Now, how can I do that? Well, it turns out that this giant network is really a huge, complicated math equation. And I can use calculus to get the derivative of each one of the connections in that network to know exactly how to change each connection to make it a little bit more likely to say lion next time. And then I go on to my next image. Here's a car. And I'll do the same calculus to push up the lion output, push down the, uh, sorry, push up the car output, push down all the other outputs. And then I'll do that over and over and over again, millions and millions of times. And eventually, the result is a network that can see and label images and do many other tasks. So uh, one thing that I want to point out is that this requires tremendous amounts of computation and data. And that's actually why we're only now seeing deep learning taking off. The algorithms are old. They're from the 80s or even the 60s. And the only now do we have the data and the computation to really make these things actually work. And I want to give a hat tip here to Wyoming and the University of Wyoming and the state for being very visionary in building these computing clusters, this top one of which has enabled all of my research. Uh, because you need these sort of systems if you want to play in this game and be innovative. However, I will f flag that these systems are now aging and need to be updated because things age fast in the computer age. So what can these things do? Well, as I've already told you, deep neural networks can now see and understand the world. It's the first time in human history that computers could really see, which is incredible. So I give them this, this set of pixels here, and they can find and label every single object in that image. I give them this set of pixels here, and they can say, a girl in pink dress is jumping in the air, and provide a caption also for this image. They can also do face recognition. So this opens up a tremendous opportunity for the world for, to create innovative new applications. So one I want to share with you, is just as an example, is wildlife management. So my colleagues at Oxford, Harvard, and University of Minnesota have put motion sensor cameras throughout the Serengeti of Africa, and they automatically take pictures of animals. But they have millions of these pictures, and how do you get the data out of them? Well, they recruited a team of human volunteers to sit there and go cheetah, leopard, wildebeest, and have spent 17,000 hours of their lives collectively labeling images. I challenged one of my graduate students to train a deep neural network to try to automate what that team of thousands of people did, and we found that we could virtually label 100% of the data, 99.3% of the data, with the exact same accuracy as the humans that perform that task, which is truly remarkable. <clears throat> and as I pointed out to the governor last year at this conference, I have also my, my sights set on Wyoming data, because I want to help wildlife management in the state of Wyoming. So with Matt Kaufman, who runs the co-op at the University of Wyoming, he has decided that instead of what's currently done, which is counting animals from a helicopter, which is dangerous and expensive, he's instead going to put camera traps and motion sensor cameras along wildlife corridors in Wyoming, automatically gather these pictures, and then team with me to use deep neural networks to analyze those pictures. And we can automatically just hoover up data from the state on where hunters are and where does are, and here's a wolf if you can see it there. And not only can we do that, but we can uh, count the number of animals and see where they're, what behaviors they're performing and just gather all this data. 
Now, computer vision not only enables wildlife management, it also enables self-driving cars, obviously. So here is a network that not only is recognizing that there are pedestrians there, but leaving ev labeling every pixel in this image as a safe place to drive, as the sidewalk, as street signs, as pedestrians, etc. It's truly incredible. You can also imagine th these kind of AI technologies uh, that are out there in the world. So nowadays, here are some more examples. Deep neural networks are better than doctors, in many cases, at looking at medical imagery and figuring out if there's a tumor or a broken bone in there. They are, it can be used in security systems to see who is coming and going from your airports. They can be used in stores to help retailers figure out where are customers going in my store? What are they picking up, thinking about, and then putting back down? Is that an opportunity that I can customize my store layout? Where are my cows? Which aspects of my crops are, are you know, infected with some disease or need to be watered, etc.? So now that computers can see and understand the world, the sky's the limit in terms of what we can do with them. But deep neural nets are not just limited to vision. They apply to almost any data. So here is a deep neural network that learned by imitation how to do what a human did. So researchers at Google had a human show a robot how to open a door, and it figured out on, a, how, on its own how to imitate that behavior to open a door. You can also give a deep neural network the ability to just watch a human drive a car, which NVIDIA did. And after not that many hours of a deep neural net watching what humans do in every situation when it drives a car, NVIDIA put that deep neural net in charge of the car, took their hands off the wheel, and now this car is driving in snow and rain, in suburbs, in highways, etc. And this is not limited to pedestrian cars. It's going to apply to heavy machinery and industrial equipment and coal mines and on construction sites and uh, in long haul trucking. We also have deep neural nets that don't just learn by imitation, but learn via trial and error learning. So uh, DeepMind and Google put these deep neural networks in front of video games, and the same exact software learned how to play a variety of very different video games just by looking and trying to maximize the reward, which is a tremendously hard task. They also had AI that beat the gr human grandmaster in the tough game of Go, and also these robots here that just play with children's toys to learn how to physically manipulate the world and, um, and, and act in it. So here is a robot here at Berkeley, which is playing with children's toys and learning how to put this red object into the right hole. Now, I do want to flag, these things take a lot of trial and error. So look at all the red paint that you see on that box there. That robot struggled more than my three-year-old does at learning this task, but eventually the robot does actually figure out how to solve the task. And so you can imagine what these things will do in the years to come. And what Google also realized, if one robot with one arm can, takes a long time to learn, I can have one brain have eight arms and learn simultaneously with eight different arms. And so if you've ever hoped that you could be in eight places simultaneously and learn in all of them at the same time, well, robots will be able to. And artificial intelligence is able to do that, which gives them an advantage over us. So, Deep neural nets not only are confined to robotics and vision, they can also process text and answer questions about it. So if you give a robot these words here, sorry, give a deep neural net these words here, and then ask it these questions, it can provide these answers. So imagine what that's going to do in customer service, for example. They can also hear the words that I'm saying and turn them into speech, uh, and turn them into words. So you've probably used this on your phone. Uh, which is incredibly useful, and soon you will be doing all of your interactions with your computer just by speaking to it, as you would a very capable administrative assistant. They can also translate live. This is something that was science fiction in Douglas Adams just a few decades ago. So you can travel the world right now, read foreign street signs, type and get answers in languages you don't speak, and this is the most incredible one. Skype has a live demo where you can speak in real time to people that do not speak your language. The network just translates on the fly. And this is already working, not perfectly, but working, and just give it a few years, and suddenly the language barriers of the world have melted away. My lab has, decided, has shown, amongst other labs, that deep neural nets are also very creative and can create fake images that look like real images. So behind you, here are two sets of images. One of these groups is real, and one of these groups is fake. Can you tell which is which? On the right-hand side, we challenge a deep neural net to make volcanoes and monasteries and ants. And they're increasingly able to generate images that look like the real thing. And they can do it on demand. You can say, give me a volcano with a blue sky and grass beneath it at sunset, and boom, the deep neural net will make you that image. We also found that the deep neural nets can make art. 
So we gave them real images like these ones, and then they generated fake images like these ones, which we thought were really kind of interesting conceptual takes on the concept. So we decided to submit them to a UW art competition, and we did not tell the judges that they were AI generated. They were competing against human artists. And not only were they accepted and hung on the wall of the museum, but they were given an award. <laughs> so just within Google, who bet very early on AI and deep learning, Deep learning is exponentially being infused into every single thing that they do there. All of the products on the screen and many, many more use deep learning as the core engine of what makes them tick. Every single company worth its salt is investing heavily and in fact betting the farm on artificial intelligence and deep learning. Every one of these companies has a major product going on. IBM estimates that it's a $2 trillion opportunity over the next decade. There's over 1,000 startups and $5 billion worth of funding going into artificial intelligence startups right now. It's just an exponential takeoff in investment in this field. Salaries and jobs for people that are trained with these skills are going through the roof. PhDs are coming out and being offered the salaries of entry-level NFL players, and masters and undergrads as well are doing extremely well. So many of you at this summit this year and last year have told you that some of my students that took my artificial intelligence classes are now in your businesses here in Wyoming helping you create products and create AI strategies, which I find extremely rewarding. So what is going on? What's the best metaphor for this AI thing? Is it a revolution? What can we say? Well, I think one metaphor that works a lot is it's the next big computing revolution. Just as there was P the PC and then the internet and then social and mobile, the next big revolution is artificial intelligence. But Andrew Ng also goes even further, and he says AI is the new electricity. He says, just as electricity transformed almost everything 10 years ago, today I actually have a hard time thinking of an industry that I don't think AI will transform in the next several years. So that's pretty remarkable. There are, of course, threats. So my lab put out this paper, Deep Neural Nets Are Easily Fooled, where we showed the world that these networks are actually hackable. So even though they can see quite well, if you want to try to trick them and fool them, you can make them think that this is a peacock or this is a starfish with near certainty. And you can imagine what happens if your enemy is able to fool your networks in that way. And the, this paper basically went viral and caused a huge discussion worldwide. It was actually the 63rd most talked about scientific paper in 2015. There are also obviously the issue of jobs being lost and needing to retrain these workers. There's also the issue of fake news. I've showed you that these things can generate fake uh, images. They can also generate fake videos. As you see here, this actor is controlling the face of George Bush. I don't have the audio, but they can also fake the voices of Trump and Obama and Hillary Clinton remarkably well, and we're just getting started. So imagine when all of the news and the media you can't trust whether or not pictures and videos are authentic or faked. And of course, there's that pesky little problem that we might invent robots that kill us all. Sadly, a real problem that I think we have to worry about. So uh, I also would uh, be remiss to not mention that software is really good when it's really smart, but it gets even more powerful and capable when you couple it with hardware that allows it to walk in our homes and in our forests to look for survivors after a natural disaster. I've talked to Jack at Trihydro about potentially checking leaks on refineries automatically, helping with the elderly, surveying fields and crops. So the combination of not just an AI revolution, but an AI and artificially intelligent robotics revolution is coming. We have the hardware, that's what you see here, what we don't yet have is the great AI, but deep learning is changing all that and enabling a tremendous amount in this world. So we had a paper that was on the cover of Nature that shows that not only will robots kind of do routine, repetitive things in your world, they will learn and adapt on the fly in your living room and in your forests. So here we had challenged a robot to adapt if it became damaged. So here's the robot at the beginning. It knows how to walk at this speed and straight. And then imagine that it's searching for a survivor and a brick falls on it and breaks its leg. Historically, robots would be hosed. They wouldn't be able to adapt. And here you see what happens. That behavior no longer works. We came up with some machine learning algorithms that allow the robot on the fly to dynamically figure out exactly what you would do in that situation, which is a new type of walking behavior that works despite the damage. So here the robot is in real time checking different behaviors to see what works. And I want to highlight this clock here. This is real time. So, so far, nine seconds have passed. It's tried out two totally different robotic behaviors. Now it will try a different flavor of behavior. It's getting a little bit faster and going a little bit more straight. Here it tries this one, which is even better, 
and is a different style, and it's almost there. And then now, 27 seconds later, according to your watch, this robot has figured out effectively how to walk as fast as it originally did and in the same direction, and now it can soldier on with its mission or at least crawl back to base for repairs. So I want you to start planning for the AI revolution because it's already here and it's only going to accelerate. So what I like about AI, because everyone presents a lot of fancy technologies and as a business person and a politician, you have to know what is actually gonna come soon, what is actually gonna impact my state and my business. Well, the thing about artificial intelligence is you don't have to guess, you don't have to predict, and you don't have to wonder. Artificial intelligence is already here and already making huge changes. So it is the current big thing, and it's something that it's good, worth investing in. But I would say it's also the next big thing, because we are just getting started and just warming up, and the sky is the limit in terms of what we can do, especially when they get paired with robots. So the pace of innovation is absolutely draw dropping. Every single month, and sometimes even by the week, new papers are coming into my inbox that really just blow my mind, even though I've been doing this for a very long time now. It's just really speeding up. So I think AI is the safest tech bet because it's already here and we know it's gonna continue to do dramatic and wonderful things. So I would ask you as business leaders and politicians to ask yourself, what is your AI strategy? Which jobs and business sectors that you rely on will disappear, and what happens if they do? What opportunities will be created by AI, and what threats, and what should you do to take advantage of them and capitalize on them? So in conclusion, the economic and scientific AI gold rush is on, and it will only accelerate. Currently, we have good AI and good robots. In the very near future, we will have great AI coupled with robots. And then obviously in the future, which is admittedly harder to predict, we will have human-level AI or superhuman-level AI coupled with robots that move around the world. And uh, I guarantee you that that will happen. It's just a question of when. So we need to start thinking about it and planning on it. So AI and robotics are gonna revolutionize every single scientific field and economic sector. They create tremendous opportunities and threats, and we need to have a great AI strategy, which begins with planning now and acting and investing now, in my opinion. Or, to put it much more bluntly, as the CEO of eBay recently said, if you don't have an AI strategy, you're going to die in the world to come. So I'll leave you with that happy thought and say thank you.